Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Berlin. I'm really excited about the next two days. We have a lineup of 155 speakers, and that's incredible. And I'm so proud to be part of this. But my board asks me every year, Mattis, why do you spend so much energy, so much resources on the next? Conferences are not your core business. And every year, my answer to my board is, yes, it's right. Conferences are not our core business, but the next is it. As agencies, we exist to understand the consumer. And since the first days of the Mosaic browser 18 years ago, we learned that te technology changes the consumer. And the consumer changes the business of our clients. And technology is always the driving force, for the driving force of this development. And this is the reason why it's important to understand what technology will be adopted by the consumers and how this will change the way of business. And to understand what's happening now and how this will change in the future. The next brings together the technology folks with the creatives and the marketing guys and the big brands with his hot startups and the agencies. That's the unique approach of the next conference year after year, from the chances of the Rep 2.0 up to today. So what's coming up? The next big change, the next frontier of innovation is data. And this change is happening now. The impact of data in our network economy is getting more and more disruptive. But many people have a split relationship, a split, a split relationship, mixed feelings about data. So I think it's important to have a view, a standpoint to this data movement. And the question is in the room, why should we love data? So a quick survey, who in this room loves data today? Hands up, please. Or I think 40%, a 40-60 split. Obviously, nobody, everybody, not everybody loves data. So let me tell a story how I fell in love with data 25 years ago. In the year 84, I kicked off my first startup with two other crazy guys at the age of, six, of, the age of 17. Here we see the three guys in the middle, that's me. Sorry for the fashion style, the 80s. And we have had an idea to create a magazine for our high school. And as you can imagine, even back in those old days, to getting paid for content was a tough business as well. Especially with this time high and money poor audience of high school students. But we created a smart ad based model and distributed our magazines for free, and we make a tiny profit. And like, most, the mo and like the most boys in the 80s, we invested our hard-earned money in computers for video games. And <clears throat> this year, and this year was my first computer, a real computer, the Commodore 64. Who of you have a Commodore 64 in the 80s? Hands up. Oh, that's incredible. <laughs> More than data love. <laughs> we should, we should uh, share our pokes later. The C64 was a perfect video game machine, but we discovered that it could be a simple publishing system too. So we bought a C C64 plus a printer and said goodbye to our old typewriters and said hello to VisaWrite for the layout and word processing stuff. VisaWrite was one of, the first, uh, one of the first real blockbuster software packages in this time. And of course, we never bought VisaWrite, another piece of software. This would be totally uncool in this time. In these pre-internet days, there exists another very social way to distribute software. In every office, in every computer department, in every high school, floppy disks and tapes were copied very quickly. And we're building our peer-to-peer -peer networks by foot. And sneaker nets were the torrents of the 80s. In April 86, 
the reactor in Chernobyl exploded. Of course, we wrote articles about this in our magazine, but we want to do something more. Chernobyl was the first plant in Europe, the first nuclear plant in Europe that exploded, and nobody was prepared for this. There was little information about radiation measurements, no transparency, information chaos, in two words, no data. And our idea was quite simple. We wanted to make our own measurements and share the data in our region. But how? Our magazine was only published every two months, and the speed of sneaker, net, of sneaker nets was too low. So we did something different. We did something what a bit illegal in this time. We built an acoustic coupler with instruction of the famous hacker babel from the Chaos Computer Club, connect the acoustic coupler with the C64 and connect both to a mailbox network. For the young of you, a mailbox net network was the thing before the internet. And that was absolutely fascinating. Not only share we our own data, we're building a network with all, our, with all other people who made their own measurements across Europe. And so we could, for example, forecast the spread of radiation on a local level. In these weeks of 86, we learned some very important lessons. First, if people have access to data, good things will happen, always. And the more people have access to data, the more value they created. And second, the, it's not only about your own data. The real power lies into how to organize networks of data. But unfortunately, there was a third lesson. The technology was not ready for prime time. Only a small minority of computer nerds like my friends and I used their home computers for building networks and sharing data. Today, when I look back to the early days as the C64 entered my life 25 years ago, we see how fundamental the changes are. Apple's army of Foxconn workers produced every 10 seconds 30 iPhones. And these 30 iPhones have more computing power, more memory than all 70 million Commodore C64 produced in a time span of 10 years. In 10 seconds, more than in 10 years. And this iPhone in my hand has more memory and more computing power than 500,000 C64s. And so that was right to say goodbye to my C64. And your iPad has more computing power than the Cray 2, the fastest computer in the 80s. And a 600 euro hard disk can store all the music ever recorded. Moore's Law is responsible for the self-fulfilling prophecy that computer benchmarks are doubled every 18 months. And so my generation, the baby boomers, the born in the 60s, are the first generation that live today in the science fiction fantasies of their own youth. And that's really great, and we should all thank you, say it, to Intel. But after explosion of computing power, an explosion of bandwidth, we see now explosion of data with an endless flow of data from status updates, from Facebook likes, from searches, from transactions, from clicks and touches, the Internet has quickly transformed into a massive network of data. And it's a no-brainer that more and more data, better and better data, is good for marketing, better ad, bad ad targeting, better recommendations. And the value for marketing people is obvious. But, and this is interesting, not only for them. I have made an amazing observation through working with our clients in the last years. Um, if you empower your consumers with data, they will love you. And that's a very amazing sentence, an amazing insight. If you empower your consumers with data, they will love you. And here are two small cases that demonstrated what that means and where you can see how brands can create value for the consumers. 
many of you know the problem, the size of shoe varies. What could you do to do to lower return rates in an e-commerce context, for example? Mirapodo, part of the audit group, aggregate purchasing data about millions of shoe sales. On top of this data, they create, instead of a social graph, a shoe graph to make better predictions about the shoe size that will fit your feet. And believe me, my daughter loved the service. And TUI Fly opened the platform to third-party airlines. The consumer is getting more and more choice and make better and better deals. And this strategy to empower the consumer with data was so successful that TUI Fly transformed in the last two years from an airline to a travel platform. But when we talk about data, what's about protection and privacy, we see the 50-50 split uh, 10 minutes ago. We all heard about the security problems with Sony and Apple, and these cases aren't just security issues. When products are digital, the handling of consumers' data goes to the heart of the brand. And it's crystal clear that our industry have to do the homework to increase the efforts to secure the personal data like names, password, and payment information. But on the other side, these kind, this, ki this kind of data, and I call this kind of data data 1.0, is only a small fraction of data we create and collect today. Today's internet is a network of data. Consumers now create extraordinary amounts of data. You see this, location data, search data, social graph data, interest data, content data. And we are far from imagining, imagining the full potential of these new data. And it's up to us, up to us in this room, to find new applications that matter to find new patterns and data that make a difference and that create meaning. And this is a huge opportunity for brands, for startups, for, agency, for agencies. Data, networks of data could create radical new insights and value. And we have the momentum here. The technology is here. It's here today and tomorrow in the technology track. Don't miss it. And last but not least, I believe we have a winning rule for this. Empower the consumers with data, and they will love you. So start today loving data. Thank you.